Palm Sunday is a fascinating day because it has both this sense of amusement and joy, but it has this sort of sense of you know what's coming to and there's a it's, it's that combination of joy and a little bit of angst anxiety has me thinking about uh clowns anyone else a little bit off put by clowns All right now i'm a little off put by clowns not through some philosophical analysis analysis it's because of what happened to me when i was 12. When I was 12, my mother uh, entrusted me with uh, my brother for the day. She had to go take care of something. I don't know where my dad was, but I had to watch my, probably in the, this is in the summer. And so I, I had to watch my brother for the day. And she gave me two bucks and said, you can ri ride up and get yourself a tape. Remember, remember VHS tapes and rental stores? So we we're gonna go up and get a tape. And I was told, get whatever tape you want, whatever movie you want, but nothing rated R. Okay, so we ride our bikes up to the video rental store and uh, we start looking at all the options. And so I'm choosing because I'm 12 and I'm taller than my brother and that's how it works. And uh, I see the name of an author I've been interested in reading but haven't gotten to yet. And there's a clown on the cover of this movie and it's NR, not rated. Now how can Stephen King's It, a movie about a clown that terrorizes children, not be rated? But it isn't. The old version is not rated. So I got it. And so we went home, we watched Stephen King's It in the middle of the afternoon, and my brother still gives me flack about, this, about it to this day, as he should. And uh, my, my relationship to clowns has been permanently, well, skewed. <laughs> I, I'm a little bit wary of them. On this day, on Palm Sunday, as we read Mark's version of uh, Jesus entering Jerusalem, and as it is with the rest of Mark, it is a story told in a very direct, simple, and almost austere fashion. Not a lot of details. As we read along, we have to sort of fill in what's happening, how is this unfolding. The challenge of reading scripture is always this sense of how would you make the movie of it? And how would you make the movie of this, this version of how Mark remembers, how Mark tells this story? And so as I imagine Jesus riding up to Jerusalem on a donkey, along with his disciples, Jesus surrounded by all the Jews who are on their way to Jerusalem for the upcoming holy days, I, I think of this crowd, and they know who Jesus is, and they have gone up this path many times before. You always go up to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is up on a mountain. And as you go up to Jerusalem, you meet people that you don't meet except once a year when you're going to Passover. So it's like this big uh, walking, roving family reunion of everyone gathering together. And they're all in a good mood because they're going up to Jerusalem where they're going to have Passover. It's like combining the joy of Christmas with the feast uh, of Thanksgiving and the excitement of seeing family you don't often see because traveling is not exactly easy when you have to walk everywhere. And, and so there's a lot of excitement and joy as they're going up to Jerusalem and I'm trying to imagine like what this would feel like what would be the soundtrack to this moment if they were uh, if there was if this was the, the movie I think it might have been something like this Y'all know that, right? That is the entrance of the gladiators by a fellow by the name of Fusik, otherwise known as the music that you expect whenever you go to the circus. You can imagine the scene where that's the music playing, every joy on everyone's faces, laughing, excitement as they're rolling along, sort of a traveling circus on their way to Jerusalem. As they're getting closer and Jerusalem is visible in the distance, they can see the walls of Jerusalem. You know what happens when you get closer, right? Things start to speed up a bit. This is where the palms start being torn, the palm leaves start being torn off and people are waving their palm leaves and, and playing around and the kids are running after each other because that point comes where the parents are making sure they have everything organized and the kids can tell so they start running and playing. And uh, the adults, 
they're wanting to stay close to Jesus because as they as they are coming closer to Jerusalem to be close to to Jesus, the one riding on the donkey, that's the prime the prime spot. And, and so they're singing as they go, and, and there are this set of uh, hymns that they would all be singing: Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. There's a whole chunk of, of the Psalms, the book of the Psalms, that is dedicated to what are called the Psalms of Ascent. And they're ascending their way to Jerusalem. And so these are the, 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 pop, the, the music. We don't know what the tune would have been, but we know that these are the things they would burst into singing as they go. And it's a sort of like ex, ex, sort of spontaneous crowd singing as they're rolling along. And we get to this point where they're almost there and they can see the gates and it almost gets to this sort of frantic sense because it's about to happen. And Jesus is entering Jerusalem. But if this is a traveling circus, then this is the moment when they're waiting for the spotlight to hit and the ringmaster to come in, and they're waiting for that voice to come over. Ladies and gentlemen, right? We're waiting for that to happen and for the show to start. We're waiting for that. And this is when uh, we've come to this like feverish pitch and the small children are fidgeting, asking their parents, why are the lights out? And it's, it's about to happen. Now, if we're in a circus, we know what's about to happen. What's about to happen is the trapeze artists and the, the elephants will come in and knives will be thrown and, and uh, the tightrope walkers. And, and we know it all begins when, when the fellow walks, steps into the spotlight, put, has the top hat on and the cane and the long tails. Right? That, that's how we know it begins if we're in the circus. What's the crowd expect here? Like, what's the equivalent in this moment? As they look to Jesus, what's the equivalent of him putting on the top hat and picking up the cane? The three-ring circus of the entrance into Jerusalem. You probably know just a bit about the expectations, like there are layered expectations here. When King Solomon, when King David names his son to be the heir, the way he marks the son of David who will be the next ruler of Israel is he puts Solomon on his personal donkey and sends him into the city. Right? To send a son of David into the city on a donkey, that is a claim of kingship. This is a claim that I'm going to rule. This is a claim of authority. We know what the prophet Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion, Israel. Shout aloud, for your king comes to you, triumphant and victor victorious, riding on a donkey. A son of David riding into uh, Jerusalem on a donkey it would be is like a politician jumping in to a, a, a stretch limo surrounded by 20 black SUVs and driving down Pennsylvania Avenue towards the White House. Like this is a, a claim of what's about to happen. The time seems ripe for this. This is an expectation people have. And, and those Psalms of Ascent, before it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, a few verses earlier, it says, All the nations surrounded me in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. Right? This idea that the one who is, comes in the name of the Lord is going to be cutting off those who are assaulting is excuse me, Israel. And so this seems ripe, like the ripe time, because the Romans are pressing down on, on Israel. Now this is the, all this stuff that we have from, from uh, the Old Testament, from the stories of David and Solomon and the prophets. There's one more event, though, that informs how they see this. Because all the stuff that happened with David was six, seven hundred years ago. It's long in the past. But something had happened comparatively recently. Something so recent that actually it's in that space between the end of the Old Testament, 400 BC, and the beginning of the New Testament, 100, or 1 AD. There is no zero here, it's just one. And uh, so there was an event that happened in 160 BC. And the relationship between them and what I'm about to tell you about, the Maccabean Revolution, is about the relationship between us and the Civil War, right? The idea, if you think of, everyone here knows about the Civil War, everyone understands how it broke down, everyone has some family that was in it, because it's not all that far back. And so for the people in Jerusalem, what's not all that far back is the Syrians, in 160 BC, the Syrians controlled Israel and they pushed too hard. 
And a king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes tried to tame the Jewish state, forbidding the study of Torah, forbidding circumcision, forbidding people from observing the Sabbath, and he started sacrificing pigs in the temple. That did not go over well. And so when, he, when the, the for, Syrian army forces start going out to the small villages and saying, we're going to start sacrificing uh, pigs to Zeus in, in your area, uh, a family by, by the last name of Maccabee say, nope. And they go back to the, they go to the hills and they start a guerrilla revolution. And, and they fight both first the local armies and then they gather people and then they fight the Syrian main army in Israel. And then Syria sends in it, its official big important army with the best tanks, etc. And they win against that. And so how do they celebrate this moment when the Maccabees have thrown off the control of the Syrians? It's in 1 Maccabees 13. On the 23rd day of the second month in the 171st year, the Jews entered Jerusalem with praise and palm branches, waving them in celebration of a son of David who has come and has freed Israel from the Syrian overlords, right? And, the same, and so for, for the next 101 years after that, uh, the Jewish people are free, and they are ruled by the Maccabees. And so after that, after the 101 years in the middle 1st century BC, when Rome comes in and conquers Israel, well, this looks like the moment when Jesus is going to pull a Maccabee. The Maccabees charged into Jerusalem, waving palm branches to throw off Syria, and here comes Jesus charging into Jerusalem, waving palm branches, and now they're going to throw off Rome. They're waiting, the Jews who are following Jesus at this moment are waiting for Jesus to put on the top hat, step into the ring, and call for a revolution because they've seen it before. They're looking for the sequel. This is something their parents had told them about, how great the Maccabees were, the good old days. What happens? If you read Mark closely, you read that Jesus enters the city and he goes to the temple. Does he say anything? Nope. He doesn't say anything. He does not call for revolution. He does not claim to be the king who will bring back the good old days. He does not call the people to arms, does not proclaim a bold plan. If you read it, it says Jesus got to the temple and he looks around. And then, because it was late in the afternoon, he left and went to Bethany. Can you imagine what that moment would have been like? Right? All the crowd has been following. They're expecting a circus. They're expecting something to happen. They expect the revolution to start. Think about how that would unfold, right? The mother is on the edge of the crowd, the kids getting increasingly restless, increasingly restless, and finally saying, right, we, we're just going to go home. We're going to go, right? And, and the groups of people just starting to finally leave as, as Jesus goes from leading a traveling circus with the laughter and, this, and, this, and all the joy and the palms being waved to finally it's just Jesus and his disciples standing there. And it was because it was late, they went to find a place to stay. If you'd expected a show, if you'd gone to the circus, the, the big tent, and gotten in, and you'd expected the lions and the flaming rings and the people on trapezes and the tightrope walkers, but no one ever stepped into the spotlight to begin the show, how would you feel about that? Cheated, right? You put all this time, you got the kids together, you went to the show, and it didn't happen. That's how the people felt in that moment. The people who had smiled and danced and played as the music built to a climax, climax that never occurred. Well, the music will play again in a few days, but it's not going to be the same joyous music. And we leave Jesus alone in the temple. He has resisted the temptation to be the ringmaster they expected. The question this week is not, will Jesus be a Messiah, the Messiah, the chosen one who will do God's will? The question is, whose blood will be spilt? If Jesus had taken this moment and, and, and called for revolution, it would have been the blood of others, and he resisted that. Instead, he will offer his own blood and forgive those who shed it. 
I am sure that many of you have put together that next week is Easter Sunday. And what is Easter Sunday on this year? April Fools. I cannot tell you the number of articles that I have seen about ways the pastor can use April Fools and all of that. And I just don't feel it. Like, I just, maybe I'll come up with something, and if you, I do, you'll hear about it. But, like, here's the thing about April Fools. Is it a deep-throated, real belly laugh if something happens in April Fools? No. It's the laughter of you're laughing at someone else's expense and the kind of nervous laughter of you hope you're not next, right? It, laughter of April Fool's, not, it's not a laughter of joy. It's not a laughter that's satisfying and free. If you want to find nervous laughter, I think you find it today on Palm Sunday. On the day when you laugh and you're excited, but it doesn't work out and you're nervous and you're not quite sure how it's going to go because it might all turn violent, but it doesn't. And then you're confused and you just go home and you go, eh, yep. This is the start of the joke. I invite you to walk with me through this holy, of, most holy of weeks to come out on the other side where the laughter will not be nervous. The laughter will be deep-throated and real. Amen.